Wednesday. We're back. We're live. Energy in America here on a given Wednesday afternoon. And we have the joy of having Lou Fulirisi right here in, in our conference room nearby our main studio here at 1164 Bishop. Welcome to the show, Lou. So nice to see you and have you in our conference room. It's great to be here. <laughs> yeah. A lot of things going on these days. I mean, for example, let me ask you first, uh, we, have, we have various positions um, that would change um, fuels, um, both uh, conventional fuels and, for that matter, renewable fuels uh, that are being taken by the various candidates uh, in the Democratic side. And I wonder if you can review those and how they are affecting or will affect uh, American, well, global markets on energy. Yeah, I think that's a good that's a, a good intro to this topic. Uh, what what I want to do, and for the first couple of pictures I'll show you here, is give you a preview of a forthcoming EPRINC report, which will be available to anyone who just goes to our website. And that uh, report is entitled uh, "Economic and Oil Production Consequences of the uh, of a Total Ban on the Use of." hydraulic fracturing for the extraction of oil and gas. As you know, uh, hydraulic fracture, fracturing is, among some people, viewed as a controversial method for extracting oil and gas, oh, often 10 to 12,000 feet below the surface from so-called uh, source rock or shale, uh, shale provinces, it often which entails the use of very high pressure water and small bits of sand or other particles to open up these very dense rocks to allow oil to flow to the surface. And it's really been pioneered in the U.S. and it's one of the reasons why today the U.S. is a net exporter of oil and gas to the world market. It was a, a remarkable turnaround. And so I think a lot of the candidates, particularly on the Democratic side or entirely on the Democratic side, and including uh, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders have called for the immediate cessation of all use of hydraulic fracturing. So one of the things is to try to look at what does that mean for the American, for the United States? What does it mean for world oil prices? And generally, you know, what, what are they trying to achieve for, from that? And is it is this sort of uh, juice worth the squeeze, as we like to say? So that is really what I'd like to start with. Yeah, well, what, what effect would it have if we stopped those operations so right let's, now? Let's first, yeah, so let's take a look at the first picture here. Uh, I think the first was just a, yeah. This particular one shows us the, what's happened to U.S. crude oil production now, uh, both conventional and unconventional, from 2000 to 2019. And the blue is really what we call unconventional. Those are resources largely in places like New Mexico, Oklahoma, Texas, North Dakota, Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, which uh, have been very responsive to the use of this hydraulic fracturing technique. And you can see the rapid run-up in U.S. oil, in, in sort of crude production between by around 6 million barrels a day to over 12 million barrels a day. And this is before we include something called natural gas liquids, natural gasoline, the liquids extracted from natural gas production. It doesn't include gas production or biofuels, but when you add up all the numbers, the U.S. is a net exporter. So one of the interesting things about uh, unconventional oil and gas production is it's a much, very much like a manufacturing process. So you have to keep investing. So, excuse me. So the, if you were to halt the hydraulic fracturing process, which is the only way to get these unconventional resources, uh, you would have a very rapid decline in oil production. In other words, without continued investment, much like a manufacturing process, they would begin to decline at a very rapid rate. So if you look at the next picture, which is, and you can see how fast this happens, right? So this shows the estimated decline in oil output from a decline in from a ban in hydraulic fracturing. And you can see that within, within just a, a couple of years, 
you there's a kind of catastrophic drop off in U.S. oil production, particularly from the Permian in Texas. One wonders whether Texas would even remain in the union should the federal government uh, <laughs> succeed in banning the use of hydraulic fracturing. This would be a devastating thing to the, to the Texas economy. It also uh, has a very <laughs> devastating effect on jobs. Uh, as I'll show you in a minute, it also will increase the cost of uh, oil uh, and gasoline, oil, crude oil, represents 60 to 70 percent of the cost of gasoline mm. and it will drive those prices up well let me, we let think me ask you this uh, uh, you know like it's clear <laughs> that climate change is upon us um and uh, you know you have we have signals of that coming from hither and yon um in many places in the world it seems like these days and there are those who who would support um you know uh, bernie um, on the basis that we need we need to cut off all fossil fuels right away sure. in order to save the planet. So I, I don't right. want to I don't want to make you a, a a candidate for president. Uh, I think we've already discussed that, and you've told me you're not going to do that. But if you were a candidate for president, how would you answer that argument? Well, first the first thing I would say it's generally a bad idea to chop your head off to address a headache. Okay. So this is the <laughs> So this is really not the right approach because like lots of things in life, they come with various kinds of consequences. Some of them are positive and some of them are negative. But <clears throat> a massive ban on hydraulic fracturing, first, politically, I just don't think it's going to happen. I think it would be very difficult for a president who wanted to do that to even get the legal authority to do it. But a president could clearly shut it down on public lands for which there isn't a lot, you know, probably not more than 10% of the production at the most. I have no idea what the number is yet. We're looking at that. So the first thing I would say is, look, this massive increase in oil and gas production in the U.S. has been um, uh, a huge economic boom to the U.S. In addition, right, which we're not talking about, but we, we have a similar kind of consequence for natural gas. The gas, the prolific supply of gas, natural gas, has driven out the use of coal. It's been a net gain in terms of emissions. In fact, one of the consequences of a ban on hydraulic fracturing would be a rel relatively substantial uptick in the use of coal in the electric power sector in the U.S. So how I would answer that as a president is, look, we need a long-term strategy that gets us on the gradient, that transforms us to the fuels of the future at some pace, maybe faster than we're going now, but it can't be done overnight. Oil and gas in North America is worth a trillion dollars, four trillion dollars worldwide. You're just going to have to take some of the fruits of that economic growth and apply them to research and new technologies. Mm. And perhaps you put a price on carbon. Mm. But these kind of talking points that candidates just throw around are really bad ideas because some people might believe them or they may become president yeah. and try to do it. Yeah. So are you saying that if we cut it off, there would be a... Uh... I mean, I heard what you said about Texas, and certainly Texas is a, it's a center for oil and gas, but do you think it would have a, um, a national effect on our, on our national economy? Of course. Of course, we think it would, you know, hundreds of thousands of jobs would be lost. And, and uh, if we go to the next slide, actually, look at the incremental recruit required from pro. So how much more crude oil will we need? Because it's not like they're putting a ban on oil production from Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Libya, and, uh, Norway, and uh, you know offshore, uh, you know offshore China. It, it, there's no discussion of that or Russia, right? So if you were to put this uh, ban in, the increment in additional production that would be needed from world markets could easily be uh, three, 3 million barrels a day from OPEC alone. 
some other production could come around from conventional production. So um, it's really kind of, you'll just be substituting more foreign oil, U.S. oil. Of course, oh, yeah. it would be produced through conventional means. Right. Yeah, that's so interesting because there's a global effect also. Uh, you yeah, create a kind of a vacuum, a and then the vacuum is filled by other suppliers. Am I right? Exactly. And not only that, because you would be reducing the world supply by a large volume, the price of oil would go up anywhere from 10 to $30 a barrel. So if you're paying three forty for your gasoline in Oahu, you know, in Honolulu today, or the notion you would be paying $5 a gallon, probably oh. very quickly. So one of the consequences was everyone would feel good about their heroic climate achievements. They would have virtually no effect on total emissions. It's a global problem, but at least we would get to pay a lot more for gasoline. So maybe <laughs> that would be a good thing. Because then we would use less. If we paid more for gasoline, we would use less. I suppose so. There's, there's a rationale there. So, Lou, uh, you know, I get the primary uh, subject of our discussion today um, is uh, with reference um, uh, to the uh, phase one of the U.S.-China uh, trade agreement, which was struck a few days ago uh, between the Trump administration and China. And although not all the details uh, have been released, uh, I guess we have enough from the public disclosures uh, to say how this will affect global markets in oil and gas. Can you speak about that? Yeah, I can talk a little bit about that. Maybe we ought to just touch about one of the things. Maybe many of, of uh, many of the drivers in Oahu and across the US have noticed that uh, gasoline prices have actually fallen a bit. Well, crude prices have been declining over the last few days. And this has to do for this corona, I think it's called the coronavirus. One of the concerns in the world oil market today, or if you're an oil producer, is that the, the, we're going to start to see a dramatic reduction in the use of jet fuel and uh, the use of uh, uh, gasoline for travel because uh, concern over the spread of this potential virus out of China is slowing down world travel. Now, it depends how far it goes, but I would say that, oddly enough, the virus is probably doing more for climate than the hydraulic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? You know, That's the bright well, side of coronavirus. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe we should touch, talk a little bit about this phase one of the China deal. And by the way, I think, you know, uh, uh, President Trump's uh, trade policy has some people who love it and some people who hate it. Um, I do think I'm not really a big fan of this managed trade. I do believe there were some structural, there are structural and serious problems in our trade relationship with China. But on balance, we would be better off approaching the Chinese with a multilateral, you know, maybe with our Asian allies or European allies, we, we would, in the end, maybe it, it would have a lot of the features that somebody like Trump would dislike, you know, it'd be a slow process, and uh, a lot of the fundamental issues might get nibbled to death. So on, on the other hand, it's unclear to me that we're really getting to where we need to go, although I do think, I must say that if you travel around China or the Middle East, uh, a lot of the leadership there sorts of are used to people like Trump. You know, they understand how he thinks. <laughs> so <laughs> let's take a look. <laughs> so why don't we just take a look at some of the highlights of the deal. And so we can kind of outline where the uncertainties were. So as you know, on January 15th, uh, President Trump and the Chinese Premier uh, Liu He uh, signed this uh, phase one of the agreement. Now, phase one is supposed to lead to a, quote, phase two. And phase two is to tackle some of the more fundamental structural issues in the Chinese uh, national economy, um, including the subsidies for state-owned enterprises and the often massive intervention of the Chinese government into the functioning of the Chinese markets now. 
How far we get on that remains to be seen. But one interesting feature of the, uh, of the text is that it provides for the Chinese to purchase U.S. energy commodities, and even if you credit what they've bought so far, uh, it implies an incremental uh, $22.25 billion of increase in energy imports for the next calendar year. And if, if you think about it, it's quite, a, it's quite a commitment because it's really the equivalent of the Chinese agreeing to purchase uh, a value about a million barrels a day. You figure the U.S. Uh, total production, natural gas, liquids, crude, biofuels, uh -huh. Uh -huh. is about 19 million barrels a day. So uh -huh. it's, it's a big number. It's a big number now. It will sh how it shows up is not specified in the agreement. The Chinese have made a commitment within sort of market provisions. So some of it could be ethanol, some of it could be crude oil, some of it could be a range of uh, petroleum products, propane, butane, different components. We don't yet know. And that's really, the Chinese are saying, well, that's going to be determined by sort of market conditions. So my only can guess is that the, the National Planning Council in China will be signaling to the big Chinese companies, to others, that they should go out and if they can make a deal that makes sense, start purchasing U.S. energy commodities. Mm -hmm. But how it's to be distributed, and also I just wanted the Chinese did not say they would drop tariffs on any of those energy products, but we're guessing that they're going to have to do that in order to get their companies to purchase it. Yeah, that's the interesting thing about this deal. It, it's not a deal to reduce or drop tariffs on either side. Uh, and no, the, no, there's a lot of postponement of new tariffs. Yeah, 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 oh, sure. So um, I guess um, if there, uh, will there be tariffs on energy that's imported from uh, the U.S. to China? So my guess is, first, we don't know the answer to that is, but my guess is in order for this part of the deal to go through, the Chinese will be reducing the tariffs. They just did not want to make it you know, as long as they have tariffs uh, on the U.S. side of, of a lot of Chinese commodities and manufactured goods, they weren't prepared to say, okay, we're going to get rid of our tariffs and you can keep yours on. I don't think they were prepared to do that. But I think we're going to see how much good faith we get out of the Chinese. And I think that's why we ought to look at that there are uncertainties to the deal. And if you look at the last sort of uh, slide or picture here, I think you can get a sense here what those uncertainties are and why it's something you want to pay attention to going forward. I think the first thing is um, the Chinese officials will continue to stipulate that all the purchases should be market driven. Yeah, well, let's China's take a look at that last slide. Well, let's, let's get that up there if we can get it up. Yeah, okay, there we go. Uh, China's existing tariffs appear to remain intact, but as I said, I think they will be adjusting those down. Uh, the, the text also gives the Chinese a lot of wiggle room based on, quote, commercial consideration. So the Chinese may come and say, look, we wanted to buy more LNG, but, you know, your pricing on that was not competitive. So we're going to have to adjust it here or there. Um, I think the other question is enforcement of dispute resolution. Uh, really, that sort of depends a lot of, that both sides buy in to a real commitment to phase two. In other words, the dispute resolution process is quite complicated, but uh, that is a feature that the U.S. insisted on. That we have a process when there's a disagreement. Like some company will say, well, I'm prepared to start a venture in China, I'm shipping some materials, but the, China's are, the Chinese are insisting a forced technology transfer, right? So what, yeah. and the company comes back to the dispute resolution process and say, look, this is not what everyone agreed to. We need a process now to resolve this. Because, you know, in, in these cases, the other side, no, this is not forced technology transfer. We just need to, we need to have a full understanding to make the deal work. Blah, right. blah, blah. So we, we have confidence in the, in the legal system. Yeah, so up to the, this point, we, we don't have confidence. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so, but let me ask you this, though, Lou. So yeah. 
we have we have the Chinese buying more energy products from the U.S. Right. under this deal. And they're going to be buying more agricultural commodities. Yes, and yes, well. and more agricultural commodities to take the right, right. pressure off the Midwest and all that. Uh, there are other implications of that, but but the Chinese are buying now energy and and agriculture. Um, you know, uh, that's good for the U.S. Of course, we want that. We want to want to have the, um, mm -hmm. the foreign yeah. exchange and what have you. But what what's the may I use this term the quid pro quo? What what <laughs> what what are the uh, what 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 is the U.S. giving up in order that China would spend you know tens, twelves, fifty, fifty so billion dollars? I think the first thing is that we are not we're halting any new tariffs. And I think there's going to be, um, I wouldn't be surprised to see maybe uh, some a bit of uh, relief on some of the concerns about Chinese technology or a different process. I, I have no idea. And we may see some reduction in some tariffs in uh, Chinese uh, manufactured goods coming into the U.S. All of this has not really been settled yet. I think both sides wanted to get this phase one deal signed just to kind of have a process for some confidence building and to see if they can move to so-called phase two. Uh, it's a very, a a very Asian deal. kind of deal. It's sort of an agreement to exactly, agree. Exactly. And, and the timing is excellent because uh, I'm sure that uh, Donald Trump wanted to roll this out as an achievement on the eve of his impeachment trial. Uh, so yes, it makes him sure look well, good I on the global he, stage. My guess is he's looking more towards, I mean, I don't think Donald Trump will be uh, convicted in the Senate. Just, there's not the votes for that. So that's not going to happen. But I do think getting these trade deals behind him, this and the U.S., uh, and, you know, US Mexico, Canada deal, getting those behind him is helpful. There's there is a great deal of disagreement of what has really been accomplished. But keep in mind that there were segments, particularly in the skilled trade, certain, certain industries, certain heavy industries, that really did believe, and I, I, I put aside the merits of what they believe, really did believe that NAFTA and China were hollowing out this heavy industry and a lot of the manufacturing base in the U.S. I must say the research today continues to suggest to me, when I read it, that the problem has less to do with international trade and more to do with the fundamentals of costs and the nature of workforce and that we have a lot of hard work to do get the kind of skill levels we did need in the manufacturing side mm -hmm. to iron out a lot of other cost issues in the U.S. Yep. manufacturing. Yep. And by the way, the low cost of feedstock, such as natural gas, such as petrochemical feedstock, has brought about a resurgence in clearly in the petrochemical industry and a lot of related industries which use those sources of energy in the U.S. manufacturing sector. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go to let's go to energy for a minute. The energy effects of this mm -hmm. deal, um, without mm -hmm. uh, you know seeing necessarily the connections between the energy yeah. part of it and all the other parts, uh, either agreed or to be agreed or agreed in phase mm -hmm. two or to be agreed in phase in phase two. Let's talk about what we know uh, in terms of purchases of energy and energy products by China. My question to you is, how will this affect uh, world markets? on energy because it's a lot of a lot of oil and gas we're talking about so i think its net effect on world markets is likely to be very muted because um if if the part of this deal is greater confidence and economic growth in china then it's a great thing for energy producers right yeah does, does the fact that we have uh, instability in the Middle East and relative stability in the U.S. I mean, it was a, a piece in the paper this morning about how, uh, despite all the um, you know trouble in Washington, fact is that relative to other countries and other continents, the U.S. still remains a relatively stable place. Um, and the fact that we go through all this impeachment and all this action in the government. Um, 
uh, does demonstrate that we, we at least uh, are following some parts of the Constitution anyway. Uh, so yeah, question, so I think it's easy. To, yeah, it's easy to look at the press and get very discouraged. It's very easy. I'm discouraged, but we have first great institutions in this country. They don't always operate, but we have a probably one of the highest degrees of contract sanctity in the world. People trust. The courts are slow, they're inefficient, all these terrible things about the courts. But they are not manipulated by the political process, right? That the business deals are assessed on their merits. People end it. I mean, this is one of the reasons why the U.S. is such a magnet. And it's quite amazing. The U.S. has, what, 10% of the world, world production. 10% of the world population, maybe not even that much. Yet we have over 25% of world gross domestic product. We're an extremely productive society. And we're blessed with a kind of huge, a large market, uh, a very efficient transportation system, with all the other kinds of crazy stuff that goes on here. We, ha we have a, one of the best places in the world or to grow business and to grow the national. Well, let's let's hope it stays that way. Uh, sometimes right. I feel we're on a slippery slope, but hey, <laughs> you and I, you and I have, you know, <laughs> slightly opposing views on some of these things. But I, I'm right. certainly I'm certainly willing to be optimistic as you. Um, and I and yeah, I hope I mean, can you give us I, one I, more I, piece, though, Luke? Can you tell us what to look forward to um, as this as this trade deal goes forward? as the world you know, is involved in some remarkable changes. What should so we be I, watching here? So what I would think, what I would look for, if I were, it was, is does the trade deal represent um, a opportunity for less kind of political or political military competition between the US and China? Can it be, now, can it grow out to an area where we can actually start to bring the Chinese around to, uh, you know, somewhat, let's say, reluctance and partial acceptance of kind of Western traditions of business and, uh, well, you know, kind of contract sanctity and greater confidence and in investment? I in knew it. Countries. I knew it, Lou. Yeah. Despite your <laughs> denial, I knew. I know that you should <laughs> run for office. And I am hoping that someday soon you will. We need you I, I in think public I'm office. Down that. <laughs> Lou Pugliarisi, the CEO of eBrink Energy Policy Foundation. We are so happy to have you on the show and look forward to doing it again and again in 2020. Thank you so much, okay. Lou.